Λοιπόν, χαίρετε και ε, καλημέρα, καλησπέρα. Ε, Μιχάλη, για χαρά. Ε, έχουμε Γεια σε όλους, μας, καλησπέρα. Έχουμε μαζί μας έναν παίκτη ο οποίος εκεί στα τέλη της προηγούμενης δεκαετίας, έτσι, ο, της προηγούμενης, της προηγούμενης πλέον, ήταν η αρχή τη είσοδο μάλλον των αδερφών Αγγελόπουλου. Έτσι, έτσι. Περίοδος. Είναι ο Άλεξ Άκερ λοιπόν μαζί μα. Άλεξ, hi, thank you for joining us. Thank you, thank you. Καλημέρα, καλησπέρα. Α, μπράβο, you remember some Greek. Α, ναι. Οκ. You are very much loved by the fans of uh, Olympiakos, even though you, you only played for one season. That's pretty awesome, you know what I mean? And I was a rookie that year, so um, it was very hard to actually <laughs> and, and crack the love that the fans give in a short period of time, you know? So I'm really appreciative of the fans of the Red Gate 7, and uh, they always be in my heart for sure. Tell us, tell us uh, what was the situation because, uh, before coming to Olympia? So I think you were playing for the Detroit Pistons. Yes. In the NBA. Yes. Okay, yes. and uh, who told you about Olympi Olympiacos? I guess a manager told you. Well, I had an agent, um, and he never brought it to my attention until after the summer league. And I was actually playing extremely well in the summer league my my first year, and then I got drafted. Where I got accepted to, you know, coming to veteran camp and getting on to the team with Detroit. So I pretty had a good career, um, as much as any person would have, and. The, the, the league that I was in, as well as the team that I was on, uh, not getting a lot of minutes with the Detroit Pistons, the bad boys, you know, who was on that team. So it was hard to actually crack the rotation of getting playing time. But for the most part, when I went down to the G League, I, I, I held my own. I did extremely well. And then um, I was ready. I thought I was ready to actually, you know, um, crack the rotation, get some minutes into the league. I came in and um, the, the summer league, the second year and I was first team all summer league that year. You know, I was playing out of this world and my agent, he said, listen, um, we have a, a offer from a European team. And at the time I didn't know nothing about Europe, nothing at all. I didn't know friends. I, a couple of friends I do that play basketball overseas, but they didn't tell me the ins and outs about it. So um, as a kid growing up, all I thought was basketball NBA, you know, so Mm -hmm. I was really um, struck by the fact that he actually even mentioned Europe instead of other teams that was probably interested in the NBA. So um, it was a long conversation that we sat down and talked, like seriously, like days. And uh, I actually got to meet uh, Penny Garrison um, in the summer league. He was the coach at Olympiacos, a really good coach. I got nothing but great things to say about him and the staff that was there. And um, he really broke it down to me and he was like, well, listen, the NBA is looking for players that are mature overseas. So if you're able to come over here and make a name for yourself, now you broaden your actually your, your career and extended it. So words of encouragement of a wise man of Penny Gerson actually led me to um, really looking into, you know, pursuing my career overseas. And just taking a look at it. And I got an opportunity to come over to Olympiacos just to visit and see what I was going to be into. Saw the, the arena, saw everything, the ambience as far as the, the beauty of Olympiacos, was, was the Glafada. And I was, you know, a California kid. I was really loving the beach arena. You know what I mean? So that took me on right there. I signed right there. And then I went back, got my bags and I was on. I was. I was on the way of being a, a European player from that point on. But it, to answer your question, literally, I was really. Um, I was down, but then um, once I actually saw um, that this was going to be something where the team really needed me to play, and that's all I really wanted to have the opportunity to play. Okay. Okay. Well, uh... and Alex, uh, you directly got a, a leading role in the team. You were the first. You, you were the first scorer. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I I was, um, man, I really had my head down. I didn't care about um, like the, the statistics or anything of that as far as the individual accolades. I just wanted to win. Um, coming from the Detroit Pistons, that's all they preach. As long as you're doing your job and the team is winning, um, you're successful and you're going to have a long career. So I was coached by, you know, Chauncey Billups, Rick Hamilton, and these guys are underdogs. You know what I mean? They didn't have a 
substantial growth as far as their personal accolades, but they were actually winners in their space. And that's why they had longevity, long careers. So I piggyback off what they did and watching them every day in practice and games. And I just seen that they were comfortable going home with a win and not just 30 or 40 points. So I took that same trade as I did over in Europe and making sure that that was the legacy I wanted to win, to leave with um, every single game and let, letting people know that I was there personally, but at the same time, our team was a winning team. I think, I think the same season, uh, Artes Masiauskas joined the club. Yes. But yes, yes. But but he was very unlucky with. Uh, with yeah, yeah. We had a we had a great team. Masiasis was a uh, elite player. He came from I think I forgot which NBA team he came from, but he was injured at the time. And who knows what happened if he was you know 100 healthy, yes. along with Henry Domerkin, who was an elite scorer, and you know Scooty Penn, and a lot of other things that we had. You know. Uh, Henry so- Henry Henry Domerkin. Yeah. Right. So we had an elite team for sure. And, um, you know, every single day, it didn't matter who was out there. Those five were really ready to compete, you know, from that point on. It was, the first, it, 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 it was the first year of the Angelopoulos brothers as presidents. What do you remember from that? Oh, man. <laughs> <laughs> he, was, uh, he was really um, ambitious, you know, and he felt that, Um, he had something as when he actually saw practice and he saw, you know, the, the potential that we had. You know, um, you know, he, they, they, they changed the modern history of the team. Yes. You know that. Yeah, yeah, they did. They did. They did. They put a lot of energy and a lot of, a lot of funds into the team, you know, and um, it paid out for sure. Uh, we didn't finish the way we wanted to as far as bringing home a, a championship from, you know, the cup or, you know, at the end of the result or EuroLeague, but I think people, fans, um, anybody, opponents saw that we were actually a competitive team and we were actually a dominant team. And they were scared to come into that arena uh, with the fans of Olympiacos behind their backs, cheering like, you know, crazy people that they normally do. So um, it was awesome. It really was. In which other place uh, did you feel the same uh, energy, the same atmosphere as in uh... Set to be honest. as we say in Olympiakos uh, Stadium, maybe in Serbia somewhere, or in Israel, or in uh, Panathinaikos as an opponent. Uh, as an opponent, yeah, there were some teams. There were some teams. Um, uh, I would say um, uh, maybe close to, to to Greece as well. I mean, other teams in Greece. Um, Addis was, you know, on top of us for sure. Um, Panther Night Cross it definitely was, but that energy and the vibe that you had as far as what the fans brought, it was, it was impactful for real. It had, you had life pulse. If a dead man was in that gym, he would come to life. You know what I mean? It was definitely something that you had to be there to witness. Um, but any other team, I would say it couldn't match the energy that these, these guys were bringing every single day as far as Olympiacos. How is the energy uh, in the NCAA because they are having their March Madness? Yes. Now, so yes. we know that college atmosphere and European atmosphere are similar. <laughs> is your is the European atmosphere much more tense? I think it's a little bit more crazier for sure. Um, the the vibe is definitely there. Um, the energy is there. Um, I'm seeing a lot of great basketball in the NCAA. Uh, the game has really changed for the for the great cause, you know, and um, the fans are there um, due to the fact that we've all been sitting at home for so long. They're jumping like crazy. They're excited just to be outside, you know, and um, it shows these young kids are really supporting their teams. They're traveling everywhere to actually, you know, cheer these guys on no matter how far. And um, I think it's really encouraging and it's great to have that kind of energy You know, and, you know, for me personally, I was an underdog. I loved playing on the road against other teams. I got a thrill and a vibe for that. You know what I mean? Of quieting their team, their, their, uh, their fans down. So, um, you know, just, just really impactful to have such an such a ambience of a team like that, um, an organization that actually keep going and pushing you on, um, whether it's your own team or, you know, the rivals for sure. 
Okay, one more uh, question. Uh, θα δάσει να πούμε στον κόσμο. Ρώτησε τον τι θέλεις, ρώτησε τον τι θα δάσει μετά. Every guest is obliged to tell us an untold story. A spicy, a spicy story. Man, you got it. The time that you fulfill your obligation to us. Oh my God. I'm trying to think of a story to come out there. Out the air. Oh man. What story where are you leading to as far as on the court or off the court? Or... Whatever you want. Whatever you want to tell us. Uh it's on the internet, so there's no you can use <laughs> bad words. You can say Malaka, you can say Malaka, for example. It's Borussi story. Everything Malaka means everything for sure. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Um let's think of something that's crazy. Oh man, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Okay. Um, the very first time we played uh, uh, Partizan, um, I'm literally, my fans, well, this is really when we had a, um, a game and I was trying to understand the European basketball because I was asking my coach as I was warming up, I was like, where are their fans at? And he said, are you crazy? Like, they would kill their fans if they came to this gym. So I was like, all right, he's lying or whatever. So. Anyway, push comes to shove. I'm bringing the ball down the court, dribbling. I'm calling a play. I don't know which play it was, but I vividly understand that our fans have a flare gun and they shot it over my head. And I can see the flare going all the way over there to the other side and it's hitting the other fans. And I'm like, what in the hell am I into right now? <laughs> Who did I get myself into? <laughs> And that just sparked something that was just like, all right, this is kind of like all or nothing. I was playing for my freedom pretty much in a nutshell. And then um, it's a lot into that for sure. I mean, I've, I've had fans that actually had crazy experiences as far as having apples with coins in them and they would throw them on us in the, on the crowd. Um, the list goes on, man, the, the things that another, we saw. There is another option to that. You have or oranges with razor blades. With razors. Razors, yes. And razors, they, yeah. And they throw them. And then they explode. Yes, yes. That's what that's what I wanted to say, honestly. It was razors inside it. The apple had razors inside it, and then it would hit the ground and it would explode, and the razors would actually go everywhere. In my mind, I'm thinking like, like all right, somebody really had to walk in the arena with razors in their pocket and an apple, knowing that they were going to do this. It's crazy to me when you understand this. They would light coins and they would throw them at us, you know, and it hit one of the fans when we played in Panther Nicros, um, threw a coin and it hit our trainer and busted his eye all open. It was blood everywhere, you know, and I really understood that this is a war. It's literally playing for your freedom. Um, if you win, just run to the locker room as fast as you possibly can. Uh, it was crazy. It was crazy. Um, but I enjoyed it. I really did. I got out of there with my freedom. Um, I'm alive. I have a limited stories to tell about each city that I've been in. And um, I'm really blessed to be a European player and experience this type of environment, you know, more so than anything. Michael, what do you think about it? Ναι, ήθελα να πω βασικά στον κόσμο, γιατί δεν ξέρω πώς το θυμούνται, το είπε και ο Άλεξ πριν, ότι πριν έτσι ένα Ολυμπιακό πρόλαβε τους πίστων σε χρυσά χρόνια. Δηλαδή πρόλα, πρόλαβε μερικούς τριλικούς παίκτες. So mm. Alex, you, you had some legends as teammates, Ben Wallace, Rashid Wallace, John Billups, mm. etc., etc. How were they as mentors, as teammates? Yeah. Yeah, no, they, they each, everybody brought something to the table as far as mentorship, for sure, and had a voice, whether it was actions or whether it was vocal. And um, I really understood how the team worked together. There was no egos, and that was the biggest thing. Um, the reason why it worked was because everybody was their own selves. Nobody was, you know, fake or generic or anything like that. She, Wallace, was who he was. He wasn't portrayed to be just that person on TV where you guys see where he's yelling, ball don't lie or anything like that. That, was really, <laughs> Rashid, that really was Rasheed Wallace. You know what I mean? And if he was on your team, 
he would give you his shirt because he was a brother, he was a friend, he was a father, he was a mentor, all those things. And it really showed that you can be yourself, but at the same time, you can't lose who you are into trying to be something that you're not. So Rasheed Wallace was a prime example of just being yourself, playing the game and really enjoying it. Chauncey Billups was somebody that, who was a, who was a leader as a real true point guard. There's a lot of people that are saying they're point guards, but a real true point guard where I actually saw him actually have 20 points and he only shot the ball four times. You know what I mean? Like it was crazy to watch him play and you'll look up and he has 15 points and I'm like, I don't even remember him shooting the ball, but he would get to the free throw line and he would know when to shoot and when to actually pass and when to be a threat and how to take over games in the fourth quarter. His nickname was Mr. Big Shot. If anybody knows that, you know, so um, those things was really vital for me to understand that on and off the court. Rip Hamilton was a true um, two guard, you know, coming off down screens, limited dribbles that he used, um, how he can be efficient and knowing that if he missed one, two or five or eight shots, he was confident to take the next shot um, the same way he took the first shot, you know, and um, Tayshawn Prince is very um uh, a person that people don't talk too much about. He had the locker room's ear because he didn't talk too much. But when he did talk, it was huge as far as the impact of what was needed and what was needed to be actually done right then and there. So each person played a huge part and it goes a long way, just not even so as far as the players, but the organization of bringing that team together and making it a collective unit. So, um, I was blessed to actually be drafted. Unlikely, I didn't get a chance to play with the mentorship as far as the coaching staff that brought this team together, which was uh, Coach Brown. Mm -hmm. And um, I was really, really looking forward to that more so than anything. But we had a great coaching staff. Uh, rest in peace, Flip Saunders, who's passed away and um, who's done a great job of mentoring young guys like Kevin Garnett, and the list goes on. But, yes, yes, yes. But the, the whole thing of it all was that, you know, it started in the locker room. It started in practice. Um, everybody was held accountable. And I was really understanding that it didn't happen just in the games, but it happened, you know, in the locker room. We ate together as a team. We actually, you know, you know, did a lot of things together. It was not one person that was walking down the street by themselves. You know, so and what and what about what about the Serbian guy? You know, <laughs> you, are, you, are Narco, speaking, Narco you are speaking about good players. You are speaking about some decent players, but yes. you are not speaking about the gold. Yeah, <laughs> the gold. <laughs> what 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 were the expectations from him? They they wanted him to um, to become a superstar, an, yeah. an all star maybe, or or they accepted uh, his presents like uh, as, a, as a role player, as a bench warmer, maybe. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I mean, they had the right approach as far as looking over in Europe, just finding great talent. You know, you got guys like Luka Donich, you got guys that, you know, we got an Italian style, uh, Bellinelli, who's playing out of this world right now. And the talent is here. And it's unfortunate that, you know, he didn't pan out. I think they drafted him pretty much too high, too much to actually be able to develop into the league. You know, when you draft somebody that's over um, Carmelo Anthony, you know, uh, whoever, whoever else they drafted over to. I he forgot. Wait, uh, he wait, Chris he, Boss. He wait, exactly, yes. And, you know, the expectation of him playing right then and now is kind of hard. And I told you guys literally from my experience of where I came from and trying to crack the rotation of these guys, the elite players from Rip Hamilton and Chauncey and Tayshawn, they weren't giving up their spots, even though we were a team. So it was hard for them to actually, for him to actually find a niche of who he, who he was. He didn't have no time for a room to actually blossom until he wanted to be. So they gave him a couple of years. He didn't pan out. You know, we had Kawhi Leonard too. I'm not Kawhi. I mean, Kwame Brown as well, you know, my second year coming back to the uh, the NBA with Detroit Pistons. And he was the same person as a prime example. And it wasn't because he was Serbian and he couldn't play in the NBA. We had Americans who couldn't play in the NBA that got drafted first rounds as well, too. So it was uh, 
unfortunate. You know, I think the mental shift, mental, mentally, he wasn't ready. Physically, he was ready. He was a beast. You know, um, he was ready. But uh, do you know that? Do you know the story? He's an excellent, an excellent wrestler. <laughs> amazing. He's amazing. He's like an MLM boxer right now. Right? Yeah. So, no, 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 no. Right now, he has uh, cherry farms in Serbia. Yes. He gave up. He gave up wrestling or boxing or whatever. Now he's he has settled down. He's really okay now because I live where he comes from. Okay. And, uh, and he and he's a very good cherry farmer. But I want to ask you: Do you know the story about him and Mariah Carey? No. Okay. Uh, by chance, him and Mariah Carey are sitting in the in the same table in a restaurant. Yeah. Okay, so everybody's excited. Mariah Carey is with us. Yes, and she doesn't <laughs> give a fuck. She's she's eating with his hands, and somebody told him, "Be cool, be cool, be polite." Mariah Carey is with us. Who gives a fuck? Give me, give me bread. I want to eat bread. <laughs> he just yeah, that's definitely him. He that's just didn't him. care. He just nah, that's definitely him for sure. Uh, <laughs> he's Serbian man who don't care. He came from war. You yes. know, yeah, nothing's really impressive to him at all, you know, and he just likes to have fun. And you know, it was it was it was too much fun that he was having instead of my maintaining his uh discipline as far as being in the in the gym and stuff. So it was hard to do that, especially coming from Detroit where it snowed constantly. There was nothing to do but be in the gym. And he did not want to be in the gym and working on his game. That was the most important thing, you know, at that time for sure. Yes. Tell us what other place apart from Greece uh, you like. You have been in Barcelona, you have been in Italy for many years now. Yes. So, uh, what place do you call home? Oh, man, good question. Uh, I, I, I really guess, I guess find, Italy. Uh, I guess Italy. Yeah, I mean, Italy for sure. I'm, I'm here right now. I cannot say Italy first and foremost, but uh, I really grew fond of um, um, Asheville, uh, Villaban. Mm -hmm. um, it, was, yes. it was a really nice city and they had everything, you know what I mean? Downtown, they had, you know, anything that you wanted to do. They had the quiet places and it was the perfect time for me to actually go into that space because I was married, I had kids, you know, and it was really a family oriented organization and it was really welcome. Um, Tony Parker did an amazing job of bringing that organization together for sure and making it similar to the San Antonio Spurs as far as a place where you can come home and work out and not have, you know, some type of lashing if you lose a game or something like that. You know, it was never something where you were, you were threatened as far as your job. And it really felt good to be in that environment to develop and uh, play with those guys for sure. Uh, but every place I've been, this has, you know, some piece of home in my heart for sure. And, um, you know, I, I really grew, um, I really grew into the French style of play in France and LMB. And I really liked the athleticism, the, the competitiveness. Um, even so, I can't even lie, the, 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 the referees really respected me <laughs> at the time. So I got a couple of fouls, not like in Greece my first year. Oh, uh, oh respect me. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> I'm an Olympiakos fan, so I know what are you talking about. You know exactly what I mean. <laughs> okay, okay. Yes. Especially coming <laughs> into um, the first year. So, yeah, it was pretty awesome to actually play in France and to win a championship. In yes, Le is, this, is, this Limoges, is this Limoges championship at MVP, finals MVP? Yes, yes. Best yes. moment in your career or not? Yeah, it was. I've never had a taste of winning a championship, you know. Um, it was more so just like personal accolades. I was really excited about for sure, but a collective unit of a team together, winning the championship and going through adversity like we did uh, starting from the very first practice, which I remember knowing that we had something special and I didn't want to lose that by, by doing something stupid or, or doing something nucleus to jeopardize this, this one chance that I had. I think at the time that I was in, uh, I was really ready to win a championship and I didn't want to jeopardize that by losing it. Um, we had some great guys, you know, Torian Green, who've won multiple championships back to back. 
mm-hmm. with the um, Florida Gators in, in college, which is unheard of, you know, back-to-back championships in college. Mm-hmm. I really had a true point guard, you know, um, as well as, you know, J.R. Reynolds, who's played in, um, I mean, I forgot what college he played in. I apologize if he's watching this right now. Okay. But uh, he was an unbelievable player, you know. I'm sorry, this is a, it'll go off. Um, okay, but yeah, no, no, no worries. Yeah, we had some great guys that I played. Do you remember? Against. Do you remember Clint Capella? Clint you Capella. Got him. He won. He won best young player of the league, and then he went to the NBA. Clint Capella, who is now in the Atlanta Hawks. Do you remember him? As yeah, a I do. Player then. Very well. Yeah, yeah. I remember him very well. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There was some great. There's some great talent that came out of the Europe for sure, and yes. made the name the names for themselves. I remember getting playing against PJ uh, Tucker in France. Yes. You know, yes. And he wasn't PJ Tucker that he is now, you know, a yes. championship prime. And he made himself who he is. And it's just a, a great testimony of never stopping and quitting for sure. Unbelievable how a journeyman in yeah. Europe became a superstar in the NBA. Mm-hmm. Okay. Okay. A testimony for his love of the game and his work ethic. Michal, you have to put it on Okay. Alex, thank you so much. No, I appreciate it. Thank you guys so much. I definitely want to say I appreciate you guys. It's, it's time for actually jumping on and getting me on here. I've been waiting to actually get on here. I told you I was going to, so I apologize for the lack of uh, commu- miscommunication. But I appreciate you guys, you know, for thank actually having me. Thank you very much. Me. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Sure. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.